Well, good morning, everybody. Here we are again, another Sunday at the Osiminski House. We are preaching out of the church, no, out of our home. Our home right now is Lord of the Harvest Christian Fellowship. Um, so I'm here with my husband, Pastor Mike Osiminski, and I'm Pastor Jan. Um, and let's just open a prayer and then I'll talk. Okay. Dear Jesus, we just ask you again to guide our words. I ask the Holy Spirit to lead us and may we be sensitive to the desires of your heart. In Jesus name we pray. All right. Well, I want to say a couple things. First of all, um, I found out that Sarah Boone, what I shared about her last week wasn't correct. At least I thought it was correct, uh, and maybe it was correct when I first um, researched her. I don't know. I can't find my information. But anyway, she she did get a copyright on that um, ironing board, and she did have a birth date. So I don't know who the who the slave uh, I was thinking of that that information wasn't available. So anyway, but one thing I did notice is you you look at the pictures of some of the um, black inventors, they use the same pictures in multiple for multiple people. So be careful of that. I don't know why that happens other than the researchers don't notice that they're doing that. Anyway, the other thing I want to say, I hope I don't forget to dismiss the kids, Andrea. So heads up on that one. All right, well, today we're looking at Psalm 135. And I'm going to read it first, and then we're going to switch and go to another scripture, and then another scripture, and then I'll end. All right. Psalm 135. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise him. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Sorry. I'm thinking I didn't read this page. I'm sorry. Psalm 132. Mm, it's early in the morning. Okay. Psalm 132. A Song of Ascents. Lord, remember David in all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord. He took an oath to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go into the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard it, we heard of it in Ephratah. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place. You and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. And let your saints shout for joy. When our priests are clothed in righteousness, then we will shout for joy, won't we? For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Let the, the Lord has sworn in truth to David. So David swore to, to the Lord. The Lord swore, swore an oath back to him. He will not turn it from him. He will not, he will set up upon your throne the fruit of your body. Your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them. Their sons shall also sit upon your throne forever. And again, remember, this is the lineage of um, Jesus. So if all these, these sons do what they're supposed to, it leads up to Jesus. We know who will carry out the law in mercy and grace. For the Lord has chosen Zion. There's our beautiful setting again, surrounded by mountains, remember, surrounded by God. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation. And her saints, again, shall shout aloud for joy. And there I will make the horn of David grow. I will give him strength. And I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. Remember, we need the light of the Lord to see, no matter what we think. How good our vision is. We need his vision. His enemies I will clothe with shame. But upon him his crown shall flourish. Well, this is, uh, when I first read this, I'm like, oh, this isn't one of the old faithful ones I know and I love. 
So what is this talking about? So I had to do some research. And can I just tell you that the one thing I have learned from reading the Psalms is the amazing connection there is to history in the Old Testament. It, they're just not songs to sing or songs to worship. They have deep meaning. They connect to the past. They bring it to the present. And I think it's really important. You know, we, we've heard a lot about Moses. We found out, you know, some things that he did, right? Things he didn't do right. But we heard about uh, Miriam's praise and worship. And so we're, we're hearing a lot of things going on that should make us, um, make our, make our, our spirits soar that God is always, always been with his people. So let's turn now. We're going to look at David and we're going to look at David. Oops. In, um, first, I'm sorry, second Samuel six. And I just lost my place. Oh gosh. So second Samuel six, verse one. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherim. Now remember in Psalm 132, we saw that David said, I built myself a house. The Lord built me a house. I'm not going to sleep in that house until I get the Ark of the Covenant in a proper temple. I do not want um, the um, the Ark in a tent. This is awful. How can I sleep in comfort knowing that God is in a tent? So David decided, you know, he was going to do, he was going to transfer the Ark of the Covenant back to his his area. So he gets 30,000 of the best men. Now I want you to remember this. This is David's plan. This is David's plan. So they set the Ark of God on a new cart. Oh, a new cart. State of the arts cart. The best cart in the world. Isn't that like men to think I have a better way? I have a, I have an incredible program going at my church that is off the charts awesome. See, we think that if we, we put our hand to something, it's going to change. It's going to make it, it's going to make it even, um, better. And when God has a plan, God's good with it. He doesn't want us messing with it. Okay. So they have this new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. Now, it's funny because Uzzah's name means strength. And Ahio's means happiness. I think that's right. I think I said that. Um, so we have, we have Ohio in the front driving the cart. And he's happy. And we have Uzzah at the back because he's strength. You know, and these two guys, the Ark of the Covenant had been at their father's house. So it's a good guess to think, especially Uzzah was thinking it didn't matter who carried the Ark. It didn't matter how the Ark was carried. He... um was thinking he knew all about the ark. Why did he know all about the ark? Because it was stored at his father's house. He was very familiar with the ark. He thought he knew everything about the ark. In fact, he thought he knew more than God did. Because why? He was familiar with it. And after a while, sometimes we become so, we become so casual with God. We think we know better. So then what happened? As they brought it out in the house of Abibadab, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ohio went before the ark. And then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord and all kinds of instruments of fir wood and harps and stringed instruments and tambourines and sistrums and on cymbals. 
Can you imagine they brought the best of the best musicians? They bought the best of the best music instruments. They had the best singers. They had it all. They figured God will be pleased. Look at this. We're going to carry it on this new cart. Got a guy in the front, a guy in the back. The guy in the back is really familiar with the ark because he's lived with the ark in his father's house. He knows all there is to know. And we're going to bring these incredible worship leaders. And when they came to Nishan's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. For the oxen stumbled. Well, news alert, you weren't supposed to use an oxen. Okay, so the oxen stumbled and then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah. And God struck him there for his error and he died there by the ark of God. Wow. I guess our God doesn't play around. And then David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord. All right. Now, after he's done angry, he's, he realized he's afraid. He can't believe what God just did. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? If he did this to Uzzah, who was familiar with it, who lived with it, what am I going to do? And so David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Geite. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Geite, three months. And the Lord blessed him and all his household. Now it was told King David was saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obendium to the city of David with gladness. Now I want you to turn to Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, wait a minute, I lost my page. Okay, I want you to look to um, uh, 1 Chronicles 15 verse 13. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. You know, the ark was designed and it was God told the people how to do it. There were rings on the side. They put poles through. They never touched the ark. Never. And two Levites or more, I don't know how many there were. They were the high, high priests. And you know, they sanctified themselves before they did this journey. They got before God and they really prayed. And then they did it the right way. And, and so David is distraught. David, David's had a rough life, and some of it's by his own hands, and some of it isn't. But in Psalm 132, we see that God is merciful. David does get the ark back, but then David wants to build this temple for the ark. First, it was Nathan said yes, and then Nathan, God told Nathan no. Well, David... God gave David, he fulfilled everything. David was just on a uh, retirement uh, with no ties. He didn't have to do anything, but David couldn't sit still. He had to get all the, the, the materials ready for the building. See, it would be David's son, Solomon, who would build the temple. Sometimes God doesn't want you to build the temple. Sometimes God wants you to just listen to him. And pass the baton on to your son, to whoever. But here's the, I think the biggest take from all this is this. David knew the scriptures. David knew the scriptures. So did Uzzah. So did his father. So did his brother. And they decided they had a better way of doing it. They had glitter. They had, they had parades. They had songs they had bands they had it all but God said I don't I don't want that I don't want that 
And we know when we look at his son, Jesus, that he didn't want that. Jesus was humble and lowly. Jesus didn't come in with the marching band. So many times we, we, do, we do, we get disappointed. Oh, I wish our church had this. I wish our church had great programs. Well, we're a little um, church that isn't able to do that. But what we center on is Jesus. And there's three things God has told us to do. Read the word. Pray to him. Get on your face to him. And have communion with the community of your church. You must be in communion. Now, I know this is a difficult time with COVID. We're not able to meet. And even if we did, we're a mask-wearing church. And so it wouldn't be um, like in the old days. But that will come. Hopefully that will come sooner than later. And I don't mean like tomorrow. I just mean when everything is in the clear. But let me just say this, that God wants us to hear his plan. When we think we have a better plan, we need to, we need to stop and run it by somebody. And here's what I think. So whatever it's worth, here's my takeaway. Some people don't go before God with their issues, their problems. They find another person. Maybe it's the pastor of their church. Maybe he's the guy they go to. Maybe he's the go-to person. Maybe he's the guy they call. Or maybe he's the guy they call to try to change his mind on some things and they won't give it up. God is... if. If your pastor is a godly man, you need to get on your knees before God. You take your issues up with God. Now, I'm not talking a prayer request. I'm not talking about things like that. I'm not talking about counsel for our members who, you know, have come to a crossroad and they need some counsel. I'm not talking about that. You know, some people voice their opinion. They want things put in the church that are maybe impractical, they're not God's plan. And so you really need to take it to the Lord. So three things. You really need to hear God's voice. You need to see his face. You need to petition him. Reading the word. I don't care what you read. But I'm going to tell you this. If you're reading a psalm and closing your book, and you don't even know what it means, you need to go back and reread that psalm. Because the psalms don't make sense if you don't know what's behind them. And I have learned so much from Pastor, so much about the Psalms. They're not just songs. They're not just worship songs. They convey a message for us now. And we need, we need to do some digging and see what it's all about. And the last thing is, you know, and I, I just want to plug this. We have many Bible studies going on. We have a woman's Bible study on Wednesdays. We have a Bible study on Wednesday night. We have a Bible study on Thursday morning at um, at the Van der We have times when we can meet for prayer. I think in when I go on and I see there's maybe a dozen people, I'm like, well, where are the rest of the people? If you're reading and studying and you're in another program, that's great. If you're not, you're, you're putting yourself out there to be picked off by the devil. Do you know that? Do you realize that? You have to be connected with the body. You have to be connected in the word. And you have to be connected with the Lord Jesus. Shame on David, really. He knew the right way to do it. But he was taken away by the world. He was taken, I'm going to make this bigger and better than God thought. And news was all about it. Yeah. I know about the Ark of the I know because it, it dwelled in my house. You have God dwelling in your heart. Do you make good decisions? Do you, are you in tune to his voice? When he says, that's probably not a good idea, do you do it anyway? Do you know what I'm saying? And I think we all have those moments. But if we're living in that that moment, forever, we're headed for trouble like Uzzah. Not that God's going to smite you down, but you're, you're headed into, into dangerous waters. 
So, okay. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about that. But keep that in your hearts. Reread that story. And remember what God ordained, how it was supposed to be delivered, how the ark was supposed to travel, and how they broke every rule. So at this time, we're going to uh, participate in communion. I love the idea that um, that we have this technology. And again, I'm not good in technology, trust me. But I love the idea that we can connect no matter where you're at. So let's just pray now. Dear Jesus, we just thank you so, 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 so much for your word. We thank you that your word enriches us and gives us a light to see, a direction to go, a heart that's full of compassion and love for all. We thank you, Lord, that you sacrifice for all. And may we always see you in that way a Savior that was lowly and humble, not, not a braggart and not proud. Thank you, Lord, for your death. Thank you for your resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this time we're going to partake in, um, we're going to partake in communion, uh, the wine. And so make sure you have something to share. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the shedding of your blood. We thank you, Lord, that you you willingly went to the cross for us, Lord. May we willingly do things for you, Lord. May we, when we hear your voice, willingly obey. Let us not be like Uzan and those people that decided they had a better plan. Let us not become so presumptuous, Lord, that we think we know more than you. And we see that repeated in the Bible. Eve knew more than you. Tower or Babel, they knew more than you. So many people thought, and even to this day, think they know more than you. Lord, may we all come together, Lord. May we reason together, and may we worship you together. Amen. Well, Sunday School, you can sign up online. If you go to lhcfwarn.com slash Sunday School. If you already have the link, jump on, and those teachers are waiting for you, and I know they're phenomenal. I hope this made sense today, um, and I'm sorry if I stumbled or made mistakes, but anyway, God bless all of you, and I, and I look forward to the day when we're all back together again, and I know it's coming. We just have to be patient and wise in the meantime, but well, God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Jan. Good morning. <clears throat> All right, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Let me get some notes here. <clears throat> we were speaking last week on <clears throat> prophetic significance. <clears throat> Uh, of the apostolic and the prophetic. We went to the apostolic commissioning of three different types of apostles. And we went to uh, Revelation 1 and spoke of the appearing of Jesus. And we're going to kind of pick up where we left off. Uh, and where we're going to go to is uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 1. I provided a summary statement from notes that I believe actually Andrea has uh, put up on our website. Uh, just adding to the notes uh, that are already there for the prophetic nature of the church, which is what this series is a part. And in Revelation 1, we know that we have an appearing of Jesus. The, the book of Revelation is the apocalypsis, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. 
And so in Revelation 1, Jesus appears to John during a time of persecution uh, by the Roman Empire, great trouble, turmoil, and confusion in the church, in the body of Christ, in which Jesus commissions both apostles and prophets to accomplish a number of items, a number of, of things are being accomplished. And of course, they're being accomplished through the entire book of Revelation. Uh, these apostles and prophets are commissioned to bear witness to Christ, to encourage the church to be faithful to his word, um, to evaluate and prophesy to churches, and those churches are being evaluated and, and prophesied to. They're called the seven churches in Asia. That's um, the group to whom the book of Revelation is addressed. In Revelation 1, 4, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Again, these churches are being evaluated and prophesied to so that these churches might persevere in their testimony and the divine call that is upon each of these churches, that they might walk in heavenly worship and apostolic revelation after the churches are prophesied to. Of course, you know, John is carried up to heaven and, and uh, much of the book of Revelation from that point on is this heavenly worship service. Um, they are also prophesying to the churches uh, that those churches might overcome the political, the religious, and the cultural obstacles to the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom and the prophetic witness that each church has. Now, with that in mind, uh, we want to understand a couple things about apostles and prophets. Those are the two main ministries that are being addressed in the book of Revelation. Um, so let's, let's look at some of those references. Now, we have actually five terms that we will be looking at here. First of all, the noun apostle, apostle names a, a ministry. And then there's a verb form that goes with the term apostle, and that means to be sent apostolically. Then there are three terms that bear reference to prophets. The prophets themselves, again, a noun form that names a ministry being raised up in the book of Revelation to accomplish these tasks. Then you have also the, you have the um, verb form to prophesy, and then you have the noun form prophecy, which is, of course, an utterance that a prophet gives. So you've got two terms that have to do with apostles and three terms that have to do with prophets. The very first term comes in Revelation 1, verse 1. Revelation 1, verse 1 reads this way, the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a book, an unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, God the Father gave to Jesus, the Messiah. He gave them, gave this revelation to Jesus. He both unveiled Jesus and gave a revelation to Jesus. He gave Jesus a revelation to give to his church, and he gave Jesus as a revelation, and he gave Jesus this revelation that he would pass on to his church. And that's going to be this equipping, this apostolic commissioning to raise up apostles and prophets to strengthen the church in this time of trouble, in this time of persecution, in this time of turmoil and confusion. Can we repeat? The unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things which must take place shortly. 
and he made it known. He made this revelation known by sending it through his angel to his bondservant, John. And the Greek word for sending is the Greek word to send apostolically. So Jesus is given a revelation that he is going to establish an apostolic mission, establish an apostolic calling, reveal a new category of apostles by first being sent to John with this message, and then John in turn will relay this message to the churches. So based on that verb form in Revelation 1 verse 1, while Revelation 1 verse 3 states that the whole book of Revelation is a prophecy. Revelation 1 verse 1 says that it is a prophecy that is going to send forth God's people in a new apostolic mission. Verse 2 says, and it's referring to the fact that um, the Lord sent this message through his angel to his bondservant John, and John then, verse 2 says, bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ as many things as he saw. Now, understand, Jesus in the Old Testament is the angel of the Lord. It means he's the messenger of the Lord. He's the one who receives the divine message from God the Father and takes that message to his people Israel in the Old Testament, and now is also being described in verse 1 of Revelation 1 as a New Testament angel. He's still the angel of the Lord. God the Father is giving Jesus this revelation, and as the Father's angel, he takes that word to his servant John. Now, when he takes the word to his servant John, Jesus' servant John, now John becomes an angel. He becomes the angel of Jesus. Jesus said already of John the Baptist in the Gospels, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. In the Greek, it's I send my angel. Jesus had angels that went before him to declare his message to his people. Jesus himself is the Father's angel, taking the Father's message to his people, his Servant John then becomes his angel and then takes the word to God's people. And it's interesting, that's why if you look at the seven churches in Asia, which are mentioned in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, to whom are those messages addressed? Revelation 2.1, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. Revelation 2.8, to the angel of the church of Smyrna. Revelation 2.12, to the angel of the church of Pergamos. Jesus is the Father's angel. He brings the word to John. John becomes Jesus' angel. And then John brings the word to the seven churches. And the apostolic and prophetic leaders, the overseers of those churches, then become the angels of the churches to bring that message to the church. So you need to understand this line of transmission. This is how apostolic and prophetic reality works. It starts with God. God sends his word. God reveals his word. And then there's this, this chain of connection that goes. The Father reveals the word to the Son. The Son reveals the word to his apostles whom he commissions. And they, in turn, bring those words to the angels of the churches who then deliver that word to the churches. So we see this apostolic and prophetic link that moves from God all the way to the churches. Now John, in verse 2, is going to bear witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus as many things as which he saw. How John transmits the word, how apostles and prophets and fivefold leaders, pastors, overseers in the body of Christ, how they transmit the word to the churches is they 
teach the church by themselves bearing witness to the word that they receive from the Lord, and they declare it as the testimony of Jesus. It's not their word. They bear witness to the one who sent the word, the Father, the one by whom the word was sent, the Son, and they, they don't bear witness to themselves. This is what the real spirit of prophecy is. Revelation 19.10 says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It's the testimony that Jesus gave, and it's testimony about Jesus. That's what prophecy is. Prophecy isn't a testimony about something I saw in my bedroom or something I would like to take place or something I think should take place. Pastor Jan dealt with that so clearly this morning. You have to do it God's way. If you're going to bring the ark up from Kiriath Yerim to Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, you have to do it the right way. And see, Revelation verses 1 uh, Revelation 1, verses 1, 2, and 3 show us the right way. Jesus, to his apostolic servant, to the leaders of the church, to the church. Verse 2, you bear witness to the word, not to your own ideas or your own desires or your own understanding of how you think it would work. Let's let's bring this word to the church and let's, uh, let's put it on a, a cart and, and let the oxen bring it and let's just surround it with a, a lot of pomp, circumstance and uh, internet exposure. And then of course, we're not doing it God's way. We bear witness to the word and we bear witness to the testimony of Jesus. See, it's not about us. We bring the word, we fade into obscurity. It's not about us, it's about the Lord. So we're talking about apostles and prophets. We've now seen the, the word to be sent apostolically in Revelation 1, 1. The first occurrence of the term prophecy then is in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads, those who hear the words of this prophecy and who keep the things in it which have been written for the time is near. Now, that's our first occurrence of prophecy. See, the book of Revelation is a prophecy. It needs to be treated as a prophecy. The book of Revelation as a prophecy, I made this remark last week and I'll repeat it. This experience, this experience of the prophecy given in the book of Revelation provides the church with a pattern for the remainder of church history until the return of Christ at the second coming. The book of Revelation is called a prophecy. Therefore, it provides the pattern for prophetic and apostolic ministry for the church throughout her existence in history. And it is a particular manifestation of the apostolic ministry. We said last week there, there are three kinds of apostles that are described in the New Testament. Those who walked and lived and were discipled directly by the historical Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, for three and a half years, those apostles that were with him who are called in Revelation 21 verse 14, the apostles of the Lamb, they're the 12 apostles of the Lamb. That's an unrepeatable ministry. And the reason it's an unrepeatable ministry is those apostles who lived with Jesus who saw him die, to whom he appeared after he was raised from the dead, to whom he spent 40 days and nights in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. He spent 40 days with them after his resurrection, before he ascended into heaven. That's an unrepeatable apostolic ministry. Once that last apostle dies, you can't have an apostle that lived with the historical Jesus before his death and resurrection. The second type of apostle we see in Paul. Uh, three times in, uh, in Acts of the Apostles, Paul's conversion and commissioning uh, experience, uh, his conversion uh, and call experience to the apostolic ministry is listed. Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. The 
actual commissioning of Paul, the difference between a call and a commission. Jesus says, you're going to be an apostle, Paul, at a certain point in time. Now you're functioning as an apostle. The commissioning is seen in Acts uh, chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas are, are sent out on their first apostolic mission uh, in Acts 13, and they're called apostles for the first time in Acts 14. But this third type of apostolic ministry is the one we see here in Revelation 1, where Jesus appears to his church in a time of persecution, great trouble, turmoil, and confusion, and commissions an apostolic and prophetic ministry to carry the church through troubled times to maintain their testimony to Jesus Christ. So that's where we are in Revelation chapter 1. Now, the first occurrence of the term apostle and the first occurrence of the term prophet in the book of Revelation is very interesting because they deal with false apostles and false prophets. Revelation 2 verse 2 is the first occurrence. It's the first occurrence of an of the term apostle. To the church in Ephesus, the Lord says, Revelation 2 verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. The first occurrence of the word apostle, and the apostle is only three times in the book of Revelation, but we have this, this verb form to be sent on an apostolic mission or be sent apostolically three times as well. But the first occurrence deals with false apostles. So where is the first occurrence of the word prophet? Well, if you drop down uh, in chapter 2 to the message to the church in Thyatira, it says, nevertheless, I have these things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet, a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things offered to idols. What is the significance of the first occurrence in the prophecy dealing with false apostles and false prophets? Well, it means that whenever Jesus institutes unveils, commissions this type of apostle, raises them up for the issues that are taking place in the church in at that particular time in her history, there will always be the danger of false apostles and false prophets trying to obscure the fact that the Lord is commissioning true apostles and true prophets. In fact, it may be the proliferation of false apostles and false prophets and false prophecies that stirs the Lord to commission a, a fresh unveiling of himself and thereby commission apostles and prophets to carry on the work of the Lord. When we look next, and we're, we're just, we, we want to look at these five terms and just see where they occur. The next place we want to look at is Revelation 5. In Revelation 5, we uh, talked about it briefly. We alluded to it briefly. John is caught up to heaven in chapter 4 and 5, and, and much of the book of Revelation up to a certain point then takes place from heaven. John goes up there, and there, 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 there are several reasons why. First of all, if you're going to have an apostolic and prophetic ministry that is effective, you have to see things from heaven's standpoint, not earth's standpoint. See, earth's standpoint gets us all upset. We, we, we get all upset about what's happening to America, and by looking at things from simply a human perspective, we, we move away from heaven's perspective, we move away from the word of scripture, we move away from the word of the Lord, and we get caught up in human reality, and we, we see things from a human perspective, we get all bent out of shape, and we start saying things that have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit 
with the testimony of Jesus, with God's word. We start moving out of our own spirits, our own fears, our own concerns, our own desires. And that's why we have false prophecies. And that's why we have false prophets. And that's why we have false apostles. In times of great trouble, the people on the fringe move toward the center. They're given a a, a voice. We call them conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories is a nice term for false prophecy. And the scripture teaches that. Again, read. I, I've, I've encouraged you uh, before. Uh, take a look at uh, Revela- um, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 8, what the Lord says about conspiracy theories. And remember, those conspiracy prophecies came out in Isaiah 8 at a time of great trouble when Assyria was knocking on the doors of Judah to overwhelm and overcome Judah. And the prophets always pointed the people back to the Lord and back to his word, not to their fears. So Jesus is commissioned apostolically. The first use of the verb to be sent on an apostolic mission is about Jesus in Revelation 1 verse 1. Let's see the second occurrence who is sent apostolically. Well, this is when John is in heaven. We want to see things from heaven's perspective. It says, and um, this is, of course, uh, Is He Worthy? That incredible song by Chris Tomlin. If you haven't heard it, Google it or Facebook it, um, uh, YouTube it. Um, Chris Tomlin's song, Is He Worthy? from the uh, album Holy Roar. What a powerful song. And he's making reference to who is worthy to, to unseal the scroll, open the book. And this, of course, is uh, something that's taking place in Revelation 4, verse 5. This covenant document is being unsealed. And when you unseal a sealed up legal document, it means that document is going into effect. Book of Revelation is a prophecy, but it's a covenant renewal. Uh, it's a covenant renewal. God's people are in trouble. God's people are, are faltering. God's people are turning away from the Lord. God's people are turning to false prophets and, and false prophecies and false apostles. We need a covenant renewal. That's what we spoke of last week. There's a parallel to this Jesus appearing to John, who was one of the original apostles, a second time, just as the Lord appeared a second time to Moses on Mount Sinai in Exodus 32, 33, and 34. Why? Because the people were worshiping the golden calf and the covenant was broken. The church breaks its covenant with the Lord when the church doesn't walk in obedience to Jesus. We need covenant renewal just as Moses had to ascend the mountain in Exodus uh, 33 and Exodus 34 to get the, the, the Ten Commandments a second time from Yahweh, from the Lord, and have the Lord reveal himself in a fresh, new, powerful, apostolic and prophetic way to Moses and renew the covenant because the tablets on which the, the, the covenant was inscribed by the finger of God Moses broke it when he descended the mountain the first time and saw the children of Israel worshiping the golden calf. The book of Revelation is a parallel to that. The church is falling into idolatry. We fall into idolatry when we're afraid. We fall in idolatry when we stop trusting the Lord. We fall into idolatry. We start accusing each other of all kinds of things. We fall into idolatry, and of course, that idolatry is, is, is described in the book of Revelation. But we need this covenant document in heaven opened so there can be a renewal of the covenant. Revelation 5, verse 1, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. There is that that covenant document. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Is he worthy? He is. Hallelujah. 
and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. Does that follow a pattern that we were seeing in the Psalms? Remember, book one, David is made king. Number two, David's kingship is preserved and Solomon is, is made as the heir. Book three, when Solomon's son rises to the throne, the people of God are divided because at the end of Solomon's rule, he did exactly what Psalm 132 that Jan read today said. He wasn't obedient to the Lord. Rehoboam wasn't obedient to the Lord. And the Lord said, if they're not obedient, I will chastise them. I will discipline them. And remember, the purpose of discipline is what? They're not being obedient. I'm going to discipline them so they will turn to obedience. Any act of discipline that God brings in your life, it's to turn you to obedience. The discipline that God is now exercising in the earth, and particularly in the United States, is to bring the church in this nation back into obedience. You remember in my, um, the famous missing tape, you know, my uh, secretary erased uh, some of the tapes, and of course that's uh, some of the things that were, uh, were spoken on the tapes, and of course, that's too old for a lot of you to remember uh, with President Nixon. But the only teaching that I've given in this lockdown that disappeared was the teaching I did on the fact that God uses plague, God uses war, God uses famine, God uses exile to discipline his people. Old Testament, New Testament as well. God uses those things. Any kind of discipline that the Lord brings is to get us back on track. So the Lord disciplines in book three of the Psalm and in that particular phase of, of uh, Jewish history that we see in first and second Kings, God allows division to take place. The 10 northern tribes become Israel. The two southern tribes become Judah. May I say this? Division in and among God's people is a sign of God's discipline. He divides us because a kingdom divided will not stand. Israel will eventually go into exile under the Assyrian attack, and Judah will go into exile under the Babylonian attack. Division equivocates Division means powerlessness in the church. Lord, why are, does the church look more like the disciples of Jesus at the mount, at the foot of the Mount of Transfiguration who can't cast the demon out of this little demon possessed boy than the church of, of the early chapters in Acts of the Apostles? Why do we look more like that former than the latter? Division. Division creates powerlessness. All these things that we want to take place. Oh, if only we had such and such a president. Baloney! It's not going to accomplish it. You can have whatever president you want. If the church is divided, we're going to be at the foot of the mountain trying to cast out the devil and it's not going to work. Division is a sign of God's discipline. He is, he is cutting the sacrificial animal in half to offer it on his altar. And see, we are broken. We are not empowered in the body of Christ right now because of our division. We need to become that living sacrifice of Romans 12. A living sacrifice called U-N-I-T-Y. Unity called, I pray, Father, John 17, 21 they may be one, as you are in me and I in you, that the world may know that you sent me, not that you sent them, but that you sent me on an apostolic mission. See, the apostolic mission that Jesus is praying about in John 17 is the apostolic mission that is being revealed and unveiled in Revelation 1 verse 1. 
So at the end of book three in the Psalms, Israel's exiled. Babylon, Assyria has done away with the people of God. And the Psalm 89 says, where's the, we don't have a king anymore. We don't have a king. Lord, David's seed have been so disciplined that they've been removed and they never would have a king from the tribe of David after they were exiled. And we spoke of that, that that speaks of the failure of man, the failure of human leadership, the failure of Jewish human leadership, the failure of Christian human leadership. Somebody says, Pastor, what's going on right now? Failed leadership in the body of Christ. You right there who are prophesying false things, failure of the leadership. In fact, you're, you're leading the sheep of God, the people of God astray with your nonsense, deceptive lies that go contrary to the word of God. Failure of human leadership. But what happens in book four in the Psalms? Well, David doesn't have a descendant to be the king because human beings fail. So the Lord becomes the king. So when you get to Psalm 132 today, do you see Psalm 132? See it in relationship to Psalm 89. In Psalm 89, it says, we don't have a king anymore. In Psalm 132, which is the songs among the songs of ascent that, that the, the pilgrims would sing as they would ascend on their way up the mountains to Zion, to the place of God's presence, to the place of the rebuilt temple, they once again say, but you're going to have a son. He's not going to be a human leader. He's going to be the God-man. He's going to be Jesus. So do you see how this failure of human leadership brings us, whether it's in Psalm 89 Book 5 of the Psalter, Psalm 132, it brings us to the same place that Revelation 5 brings us. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or look at it. Now keep in mind what church tradition teaches about John's vision of Jesus in Revelation 1. Guess who's the only one of the apostles that are listed in 1 Corinthians 15 left. It's John. All the rest of them have died or been martyred, including Paul at this time. See, the, the, the real apostolic and prophetic leadership, it's gone. Other leaders have failed in the body of Christ and are failing at this time. And John says, we need a covenant renewal, but where's the apostle or the prophet? To, to, to loose this document and set this covenant renewal in motion. It's just like Moses. It's just the parallel to Moses 32, 33, and 34. Read Moses 32, 33, and 34 in, in conjunction with this picture I'm giving you about the book of Revelation and this commissioning of a new apostolic ministry. Read them together and see. Moses, his big thing is, who are you going to send with us, Lord? Yes, you you forgave the people of their sin. You were going to destroy them all. And I said, please forgive their sin. But they need something more than their sin forgiven. They need you, Lord, to be with them. They need you to appear in their midst. They need you to walk with them. They need you in, oh yes, just like what David needed in 2 Samuel 6. See all the parallels? The word of God, it just, it flows. It flows together. See, the Lord's telling a story. He's, he's unveiling a narrative. He's showing an eschatological plan. The same plan, it's a simple plan. It's there from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 and everything in between. It's this plan, how God works. See, David says, okay, I'm king now. That's awesome. But the ark isn't here in Jerusalem. I, I, I can't be king without the real king being with me. Let's bring the ark up. 
And he screws up, of course, the first time, and people pay the price. But God writes it, and it's the same thing with Moses in Exodus 32, 33, and 34. The people screw up. God forgives them, but says, well, I'll forgive them, but I don't want anything to do with them. Do you understand that? That God Being forgiven for your sins is awesome, great, powerful, wonderful. But you need something more than God forgiving your sins is his presence with you. Show me your glory, Moses says. He says, look, 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 I, I, I'm glad we're forgiven, Lord, but these people belong to you. They're on a mission from God, Lord. It's an apostolic mission. It's a prophetic mission. And it's not going to be accomplished unless you're with us. This is what we need to be praying right now. Are you with us? Where are you, Lord? Where are you? And he says to Moses, okay, you found favor in my eyes. See, he's an intercessor. Oh my gosh, we need prophetic and apostolic intercessors. We need apostles and prophets who pray. And the Lord says, you found favor, so I'm going to answer your prayer and I'm going to go with you in your midst. The same thing, this is the question in Revelation chapter 5. But are you going to go with us in our midst, O God? We are seeing the rising of the beast, the rising of the false prophet, the rising of the great harlot, which of course we see in chapters 13 and 17 and 18 of the book of Revelation. We need you to go with us, Lord. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And here we go with covenant renewal. Just as the Lord says, Okay, Moses, I'll go with the people. It's always about God dwelling in a tent. David brought the ark up in 2 Samuel 6 and 7 and put it in a tent. Moses it has a tent. And, and as we saw in Exodus 33, Moses goes to the tent and Yahweh speaks to him face to face, but all the people are at a distance watching. No, no. Lord, we, 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 we want your tent to be in the midst of your people. We want you to dwell in the, uh, in the Ark of the Covenant in the midst of your people, not, not outside the camp where I can go. I mean, there's, there's so much uh, leadership right now in the body of Christ that calls itself apostles and prophets, just as it did in Revelation. And it's Old Testament models. It's, look at me, I'm this great person that dwells in the tent outside the camp with God. Look how great and mighty I am. Moses didn't care about that. Who cares that you speak to me face to face? I've said this all the time. And see, some people have taken me at my word. I've said... I cannot succeed. Mike Osminski, I don't care if, how, how clearly I see God, how clearly I hear God, how truthfully I speak the word of the Lord. I cannot succeed without the rest of the body of Christ with me where I am in the presence of the Lord. Well, some people, you know what some people have done? Ah, they've heard that. And so they purposely leave. They purposely slander. They purposely accuse. Well, I'll, I, he said he can't do it without me, so I'm I'm going to move out the door. But see, that's the the heart of a, of a new covenant leader. Moses looks like a new covenant leader. He's saying, "It's not good enough that you speak to me face to face, or will you dwell in the midst of the people?" So this is covenant renewal. The Lamb is worthy. Is he worthy? Yes, he is. He is, he is. The song, you got to listen to that song. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders, so you got a throne with God and the Lamb on it. You've got these 24 elders, which are, they're supernatural beings that represent powers and principalities that exercise the Lord's authority among the people of God, and you've got living creatures that bear up the throne, supernatural beings surrounding the throne that make certain that the will of God 
is manifested and taking place not only in heaven, but in the earth. In the midst of all of, all of these heavenly leaders, heavenly authorities, heavenly worshipers, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. Now catch this. Which are the seven spirits of God sent out apostolically in the earth. Praise God. Jesus is sent out apostolically in Revelation 1 verse 1. And the second occurrence of that verb to be sent out apostolically, the Holy Spirit is sent out apostolically. Do you understand? Irenaeus said it early on in church history. He called the Son and the Spirit the two hands of the Father who are sent out in the earth to perform the mission of God. Just as Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to heaven I'm leaving you guys, but I'm sending the Spirit and it's going to be better for you that I go to heaven and leave and I send the Spirit because my Spirit is going to empower you for the mission to bear witness to Christ, to be faithful to the Word, to be raised up apostolically and prophetically, to carry out my covenant renewal in the earth. So our second occurrence, Jesus and the Spirit are both sent out apostolically. The next place we have to go to for this terminology is Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. Now, Revelation 10 is a transitional passage in the book of Revelation. In the first 10 chapters, John is observing. Remember, early in the book in chapters 1, 2, and 3, it talks about writing down uh, the things that you see. You know, uh, the exact terminology is um, you must uh, reveal things that must shortly take place. You must bear witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus to everything that is seen Blessed are those who read and hear and keep the things written in it, for the time is near. John's an observer for the first 10 chapters. He's just, he's watching. He's watching Jesus unveil and be unveiled in chapter one. He's hearing the prophetic words to the seven churches, uh, in Asia in chapters two and three, in chapters, uh, four through nine. He's just, he's being a witness to the scenes, the events in heaven, the seven seals, uh, being, uh, broken so that the, the covenant renewal can begin, the seven trumpets being, uh, uh, blown so that the people of God p can gather together to celebrate the, the feasts and to, and to gather together for war and to hear the word of the Lord proclaimed. In chapter 10, it's a transition. He goes from being an observer to being a participant. The Lord says, now you go do. You've seen, now do. Now that gives us a pattern for apostolic and prophetic ministry. It isn't about jumping right in and doing. Hey, I got, I got a prophecy from the Lord and I'm going to start uh, my own local church right now because God gave me a couple things. I'm going to go on a, a, you know, national website. I'm going to form a national website because God showed me a few things. We need to take the time to see what heaven reveals, to hear what heaven proclaims. And at a certain point in time, the Lord will say, now what you've seen, begin to do based on it, begin to proclaim. So this is what we see taking place with John in chapter 10. And this is, again, one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb being commissioned in a, a new type of apostolic ministry, a, a new level of apostolic and prophetic authority, intensity, revelation. And the guy's just sitting back and watching. Can you imagine a man who's maybe at this point 70 years old or thereabouts who's walked as a powerful, mighty apostle through the Gospels, through Acts of the Apostles, sitting back and just saying, boy, i got some things to see here and I've got some things to learn here. But again, that's the heart of a disciple. So the, the next place we see um, this, this idea of 
one of the five terms. Now we'll pick it up in Revelation 10, 5. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. David takes an oath in Psalm 132, then the Lord makes an oath. And, and now here's this, this supernatural angel Again, a messenger. See, angels proliferate the book of Revelation. Jesus is an angel. There are supernatural angelic beings called angels. And there are human apostolic prophetic leaders called angels. Because everything's about God has a message. And he is conveying that to the heavens and the earth through his angelic beings. See, if anything... What angels, the, the angelology, the understanding of the purpose of angels it, that the book of Revelation portrays is angels are simply messengers to proclaim the Lord's word. If it's not the Lord's word, it's a false angel. If it's not the Lord's word, it's an illegitimate angel. If it's not the Lord's word, it's a fantasy angel. Okay. Angels have one purpose, whether they're divine angelic or human, and that's to proclaim the word that the Lord gives to them. See, God is in charge. Hallelujah. Now this angel, verse 6, swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, earth and the things that are in it, sea and the things that are in it, that there should be time no longer. No more chronological time, we're, we're, we're dealing with prophetic time. That's his chronos. Remember the relationship between chronos, chronological time, and kairos, which is prophetic time, is, is seen particularly in the book of Revelation. It says, here's the final prophecy. Revelation 1 verse 3, the words of this prophecy. This is the final prophecy that's going to be uttered in church history. And what I mean is the final prophecy that we would canonize as scriptural prophets can still prophesy now that's not what we mean this we talk about this eschatological dimension of prophecy that sets in motion just what human history is going to be like how it's going to unfold chrono stops chronological time stops with the authority of the prophecy of the book of revelation and we enter into kairos time prophetic time. Human history from henceforth is just under prophetic time. And prophetic time means the kingdom of God is the primary political method of how God will establish his purposes on the earth. That's a word for an upcoming Sunday. God does not use any human nation in history to accomplish his purposes. He uses Israel under the old covenant terms and the church under the new covenant terms. There's no other chosen nations in scripture. Chronological time has ceased. We're on prophetic time. And see, this is important for John. He's understanding now he's got to begin to function apostolically and prophetically. He's been an observer up to this point. Now he's got to function apostolic and prophetic. There will be chronological time no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. There's the word, prophets. See, we have apostles being commissioned and we now have prophets being commissioned. And notice, this is prophets are commissioned under the auspices and the revelation of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation, they are, they do what they do in the shadow of the finishing of the mystery of God. What's the mystery of God? Well, who is God? Well, he's pretty clearly under new covenant terms and finally so in the last book of the New Testament in the book of Revelation. He's Father, He's Son, and He's Spirit. And as Irenaeus said, Everything originates with the Father. Everything originates with God. We see that in the book of Revelation. And his two arms, his two hands, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. So prophets prophesy in the shadow of the Father working through the Spirit and working through the Son to empower the church to bear witness to him, to bear witness to the kingdom in this context of Great trouble, great 
turmoil, persecution, confusion. And then we, um, well, we can continue here. Then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. There's little books, big books. There's scrolls. There, you, you, what it is, is, is the large scroll is seen in Revelation 5, 6, where that the lamb that Jesus unseals to renew the covenant and then the prophets and the apostles are given little books. They're given a, 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 a miniature reduplication. You know, the, 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 um, the scroll of covenant renewal that Jesus unseals, it's put in a heavenly Xerox machine. Copies are printed out and the apostles and prophets are given a little version of it to keep in their pocket because they are now becoming vessels of covenant renewal. except here's the catch. So I went to the angel and said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. This is a commissioning exercise, just as Ezekiel was commissioned. Remember, he had to eat a scroll. This is a commissioning. And here's commissioning under actually both Old Covenant and New Covenant terms, but particularly brought out under New Covenant terms. It tastes sweet to your mouth, but it's bitter in your stomach. See, there's a price to pay for being an apostle, a prophet, a fivefold leader, a proclaimer of the word of the Lord under New Covenant terms. And that is you will never escape from the model that Jesus is. He walks through life with a tear-stained smile. Jim Valley, circa 1970, Jesus Movement. Song I've never forgotten. I forget songs that I heard yesterday, but when I can remember a song from 1970 that I heard, the Lord has inscribed it in my heart with the finger of God, with, with, a, with a flaming, flaming piece of coal. There, is, there will always be suffering associated with apostolic, prophetic, pastoral, teaching, evangelist, ministry. Cannot escape it. If somebody's looking for everything to go sweet and well, I call that the myth of America. That is false prophecy. The biblical model is always pick up your cross and follow after me. So it is in this commissioning. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hands and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must, and here's the occurrence of the term, prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And now he is commissioned not just to be an observer of all these heavenly realities, but now go forth to proclaim it. And that's why when we go into chapter 11, immediately when we go into chapter 11, this apostolic and prophetic commissioning kicks in the gear. What started in Revelation 1, what issued in some very clear prophecy to the seven churches, what, 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 what experiences all of this, this heavenly, heavenly unveiling, heavenly reality, heavenly perspective. Now, back on earth, John must now begin to move in this new, fresh apostolic commissioning. And he's going to run into the beast, the false prophet, and of course the great harlot, as hindrances, as obstacles, but as the very reason whereby this apostolic and prophetic ministry is raised up and commissioned by the Lord. So in this respect, we can thank the Lord for what's going on now and what may yet happen, which may I say, it things may yet get worse before they get better, but it will be in the midst of this that this new, fresh, powerful, 
apostolic and prophetic call is going to be released. Those of you who are prepared, those of you who are being prepared, be prepared. The Lord is going to do something powerful and mighty in the earth that we have not seen in our lifetime and perhaps, perhaps will eclipse what we've seen in the history of the church. So what takes place then in Revelation 11, the two witnesses. Now the two witnesses are, are a picture of Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament. And, and I'm going to say this without explaining it right now. Don't have the time to do it because we're at 1224. That, that would be a, a, another dimension of teaching. But Moses and Elijah do not represent, the two witnesses in Revelation 11 do not represent just idealized prophetic ministry. It, 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 it represents idealized apostolic and prophetic ministry. Okay. Moses, while he is called a prophet, I, I mentioned this in passing several times. I throw these little tidbits out and you're supposed to scratch your head and say, how could that be so? Well, I'll wait for Pastor Oz to talk about it. How about doing some research yourself? Don't, why, why do you got to wait for Pastor Oz? You know, Pastor Oz may never get to it. But Moses actually represents an apostolic call. Elijah represents the prophetic call. Elijah is seen here as the ultimate prophet. Moses as the ultimate type, the ultimate picture of an apostle. Let me just tell you this. Read Exodus chapter 3. The key term that is used for an apostle is an apostle, an apostolos, is a sent one. One who is sent on a mission. Again, as I've said, the verb form, apostello, in the Greek means to be sent on an apostolic mission, to be sent on a mission. Look at Moses' call in Exodus chapter 3 particularly verses 10 through 15. The Lord says in those verses how I am sending you, Moses. I am sending you, Moses. I am sending you. Now, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's apostello. I'm sending you on an apostolic mission. In the Hebrew, it's, um, it's shalach, which is where we get the term shaliach. The shaliach is the messenger of the covenant. The shaliach is the apostle, the apostolic figure in the Old Testament. The Hebrew word shalach, that verb corresponds to apostello in the Greek. And the Lord is sending Moses out apostolically as his apostolic representative. So here we come to Revelation 11. And the verses we're going to see here, Revelation 11, 3, the Lord says, I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy three and a half years clothed in sackcloth. That's the final three and a half years of the 70 weeks of Daniel. The final three and a half years of a 490 year period of time that was prophesied by Daniel in Daniel 9. That's a whole other teaching in and of itself. May I just say to you this idea that there's this teaching uh, that says, oh, the book of Revelation is about the seven years of the great tribulation. This seven years isn't mentioned any place in the book of Revelation. It's three and a half years because the final seven years of the 490 year period that's prophesied in Daniel 9, that's Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and the mission of the church is included in those final seven years. How long of a ministry did Jesus have? Three and a half years. It says in Daniel 9, in the middle of the final seven years of this, you know, it's a messianic prophecy in, uh, at the end of uh, the book of Daniel chapter 9, that the, the, the anointed one of the Lord would be cut off in the middle of that final seven years. Jesus' ministry at three and a half years, he was cut off, he was put to death. And then the f only thing that's left to be completed is three and a half years that's what the book of Revelation is about. And that three and a half years is that's why chronological time ceases in Daniel 10 and prophetic time begins. That final three and a half years that the book of Revelation is about 
covers the entire history of the church because chronological time has stopped. We, we've been in prophetic time since the first century. It's a prophetic time where we are called to bear witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. That's the gospel. It's about the gospel, brethren. It's all about the gospel. All right. So his two witnesses are going to prophesy. Moses as an apostolic figure, Elijah as a prophetic figure. See, pr prophecy is not just something prophets do. Prophecy is what the church does. Prophets do it. Prophets, prophets embody it in their ministry. See, the church is apostolic, but that apostolic anointing of the church is embodied in the ministry of an apostle. The church is prophetic, but that ministry of, a, of the prophetic is embodied in the prophetic office. The church is pastoral, but a, a, a pastor, a shepherd of a church, embodies that pastoral ministry. The church has a didactic anointing, an, an, an anointing to teach. Didasco is the Greek word for, for teach. The church has a teaching ministry, but that's embodied in the office of a teacher. And the church has an evangelistic anointing, but it's embodied in the office of an evangelist. See, the, the, the fivefold ministers, what they are in themselves is, is what the church is collectively. The church has those anointings, and the job of those fivefold ministers are to bring forth that anointing in the midst of the body of Christ, in the midst of the church. So the, the, the next reference then is in verse 6. These two witnesses have power to shut up heaven so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. That's what Elijah did. And they have power over the waters to strike them to blood and to strike the earth with plagues as often as they desire. That's what Moses did. They're, they're, again, they are prophesying. And then finally, in uh, verse 10, see, eventually what they do is the, the world overcomes the, the apostolic and prophetic ministry of, of the church, puts it to death. In other words, there are always going to be times in church history where it looks like, man, God's people are finished. I mean, God's people looked finished in Nazi Germany, didn't they? under the alt-right, the far-right leader known as Hitler. Hitler wasn't a socialist. He wasn't a communist. You can't equate communist left-leaning leaders, socialists, with Hitler. You can't do it. He a, was a right-wing extremist. Socialists are left-wing radicals. The church looked dead what does the Lord do here? They're, they're, they're put to death. People rejoice. Ah, Christianity is false. We, we, we beat them. They're a bunch of idiots. Verse 10, And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over their dead bodies, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life of God from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. See, just like Jesus, he dies, the devil says, Amen. The Romans say, we got rid of that insurrectionist. The Pharisees and the scribes and the Jews say, we're done with him. But it only looks that way, because God has the power of resurrection life. So, so there will be times and seasons where it looks like the apostolic and the prophetic die. The apostolic and the prophetic, uh, they, they, um, they succumb to the, the world. But brethren, they, they, they don't succumb to the world. They don't succumb to the world. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. The Lord raises this ministry back up. And then verse, um, verse 13 
ties together this apostolic and this prophetic commissioning, this apostolic and this prophetic commissioning with the seventh trumpet being blown. And look at what the seventh trumpet blows. Then the seventh angel sounded, verse 15, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, and this is important, this is where covenant renewal, apostolic and prophetic ministry always end up. This is the purpose of bearing witness to the word and the testimony of Jesus. The kingdoms of this world, the kingdom, singular, depends which Greek text you're looking at. I'll read it from the text in front of me here. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The world's kingdom is set aside. All human political notions set aside and the world comes under the authority of the Lord and of his Christ. So the purpose of this new apostolic and prophetic commissioning is to establish the kingdom of God in the earth. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is to come, because you've taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come, the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. This is what God is moving toward in church history. His prophets, his saints, those are the ones who received the kingdom from the Son of Man in Daniel 7. They're called the saints of the Most High. And remember, in our study of Psalms, the saints are the chesed ones, the ones who are immersed in the steadfast love of the Lord and those who fear his name. They rise up and the kingdom of heaven is established in the earth. All right, let's let's close this up with our our references here. Uh, chapter sixteen is the next reference to one of these five terms. Chapter sixteen is in the midst of the um, the plagues, the final plagues being poured out on the earth before the end, and um, we're in the middle of the third bowl, and each bowl contains plagues being poured out on the earth. And 16.4 says, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood, similar to the plagues in Egypt, that set God's people free from the oppression of Pharaoh and Egypt. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord. You are the one who is, who was, and is to be, because you have judged these things. Now, this is the Lord bringing judgment on the earth. And why does God bring judgment on the earth? For they have shed the blood of your saints and your prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for this is their just due. This is why when you eat the little scroll and are commissioned, almost finished, and are commissioned in Revelation 10, and it says, this, this prophetic word, this apostolic word that you're given is going to be sweet in your mouth, but bitter in your stomach. It's because where does the testimony of the Lord ultimately end? It ends with martyrdom. Christians are put to death for their testimony. Now keep in mind the Greek word for a witness at this particular time when the book of Revelation was written and the earlier portions of the New Testament. It's the word martyr in, in Greek. It's just one who bears witness, a person who bears witness in court. In this case, it's the court of heaven, as we see in chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. It's just a witness. It's one who says, this is what I heard, this is what I saw. That's what the book of Revelation is raising up, witnesses for the Lord. But because persecutions began to increase, in the late, later part of the first century and onward for several centuries in the New Testament church, people began to lose their lives because they were Christian. Martyr became a, a theological term, not just a biblical term, and it was one who 
lost his or her life because they bore witness to the Lord. Well, we understand that has taken place throughout church history. I've said this many times to my church, but in the 20th and the 21st century, there have been more Christians put to death because they're Christians than in centuries 1 through 19 put together. Martyrdom is not on the decrease, it's on the increase. But those who shed the blood of the saints and prophets, ultimately, their judgment comes from the Lord. Which brings us to our, our last couple of references, Revelation 18. Now, in, as I said, in Revelation 13, the beast and the false prophet begin to oppose the, the, the testimony of the church. The beast is political power. The false prophet is religious, philosophical, ideological power, uh, worldviews that are different from the Christian worldview that says, oh no, this is true and that is true and this is false and that is false. That's just, that's false prophecy. False prophecy doesn't have to be somebody prophesying in Jesus' name and it's not correct. False prophecy is, is, is part of all the philosophical, religious worldview structures of the earth throughout human history. And then, of course, we come to 17 and 18, the great harlot, her materialism, her sensuality, her human trafficking, her, her immorality, all these, uh, her drugs, drug use. Remember, drug use, pharmakia, is called uh, one of the works of false prophecy in the book of Revelation. All of these works coming against the church to destroy the church. And when the church stands up and says no to that and yes to Jesus, there's martyrdom. So we go to Revelation 18. And Revelation 18, we're just going to go to Revelation 18, 20. This is the fall of Babylon. The Lord judges Babylon, this, this, this materialistic system that tries to dominate the earth through using political, religious, philosophical means other than the gospel. Revelation 18.20 when Babylon falls, rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets. Here's a place now where apostles and prophets, both terms are brought together. For God has vindicated you on her. Then a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and threw it, threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. Remember what, when was a millstone hung around your neck and cast into the water? When you offended one of these, my little ones, the least of mine. It's better for you that a millstone be hung around your neck and cast into the sea than for you to offend one of my little ones. To offend means to cause to stumble. It doesn't mean, oh, you, you offended me with what you say. You, when you cause somebody to stumble when, through false prophecy, when you cause somebody to turn away from the Lord, and this is what Babylon and the beast and the false prophet do, they will be judged accordingly. And the sound of harpists, musicians, flautists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you, Babylon, anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And you know, that's pharmakia right there. I gave you a, a spoiler alert. By drug use, all the nations were deceived. Do you understand? Drugs, use of drugs, is, is, is part of the reason why people are so open to false prophecy. It's sorcery. It's witchcraft. It's beyond drugs. It speaks of, it speaks of drug use was, was utilized by false prophets in the Old Testament to induce a supernatural state whereby one could be visited by powers, spirits, and see, our, our world has really been prepped, been prepped by Babylon. If you want to see how Babylon preps the world, read through the entire chapter 17 and 18 of Revelation and see how Babylon preps the world for false prophecy. 
And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who were slain on the earth. Chapter 19, the verse reference I've made uh, allusion to frequently. An angel speaks the word of the Lord to John, and John says in 19.10, And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. A couple quick remarks. No prophet who desires you to worship him. And worship just means to esteem as great, awesome, wonderful, powerful. The new covenant has put an end to that. There's, do you understand? Nobody's of any significance except Jesus. That's where the old covenant has changed from the new. It's not like, oh, look at Isaiah the prophet. It's look at, well, I don't even remember that person's name, but he bore witness to Jesus. See, true angelic ministry deflects worship and affirmation from itself and says, worship God. The true spirit of prophecy creates worshipers of God, not worshipers of men. And it bears witness to Jesus. So I mentioned to you that Revelation 21, 14, we don't have time to make reference to it. I've already run over too far. Revelation 21, 14 makes reference to the, the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And the final chapter that deals with the closing of prophetic and apostolic ministry that is birthed in Revelation 1 looks like this. Go with me to verse 6 of 22. We're going to just read these. Then he said to me, 22.6, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the spirits of the prophets sent his angel to show his bondservants the things which must take place quickly. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The book's a prophecy. The prophet's function in the context of that book. That's to bear witness to Jesus so that the kingdom of this world can become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Now I, John, saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. See, he falls down to worship Jesus who's unveiled in John 1 verse 17, and there's the power of Jesus is so great in these angelic figures, these apostles, these prophets, these supernatural beings, that it's Jesus is in them so much that he wants to fall and worship them, but see, the true apostolic, angelic, prophetic minister always says, get up off your feet. See that you don't do that, verse 9, for I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. True apostolic and prophetic ministry commissioned by this new fresh unveiling of Jesus will bring you only to one place and one place only. Who, Who was that idiot? at Lord of the Harvest sharing these things. I don't remember, but I'm going to worship God. Hallelujah. And I hope this idiot is included among those idiots who are bearing witness to Jesus. May God get the glory. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. Daniel was sealed up. This book's unsealed. Covenant renewal is taking place. And the final Two references are in 18 and 19, and we close. This is verse 17. Actually, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify. These are all the angelic, apostolic, prophetic witnesses gathering together, the spirit and the son, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, false prophecy, God will add to him the plagues that are written in the book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, false prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Notice how significant false prophecy is. 
And if you add something to what God said, you say everything that the Lord says and you add something to it, that's false prophecy. If you look at what God says and you take something from it, that's false prophecy. We're, we're getting a definition of false prophecy. In other words, if we add anything to the revelation of Jesus, we take anything away from the revelation of Jesus, we are in danger of being coming false prophets and apostles. Lord, may it be for the church that in this hour when you're going to unveil Jesus in this new, fresh, powerful way to commission us in a new apostolic and prophetic anointing for this hour to battle our version of the beast, our version of the false prophet, our version of Babylon, slightly different versions from the ones that John dealt with in the first century, but as we deal with our version, Lord, then we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and empower us to rise up in the power of the gospel that the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.